Hey everybody, and welcome back. Okay, that was silly. I almost started this a couple of minutes ago, but realized I hadn't plugged in my microphone. So here I am chatting away and nothing. Well, I guess that's just life, isn't it? I promise I'm not going to have as long of, as, of an opening as I did on the last chapter. Um, I don't know what happened there. I just started talking and I couldn't stop. Um, I wanted to go out today, to go run up to the store, get some stuff. But I do not want to go out with the boot on into that cold slushy snow because I just know no matter how much I winter proof proof my boot it's still gonna get up inside and that'll be very very cold I mean I'm gonna put a garbage bag around it so the uh the padding in the boot won't get messed up. But it's going to make my foot very, very chilly. And of course, I could grab a cab. But why waste $10 to go up to the store? I guess my big thing is, is I really wanted to just go to... Uh, I wanted nibbles. Not that I need nibbles, but I wanted nibbles. And I wanted to grab some storage. But I think it's better if I wait a bit on that. So, today, we're going to go with chapter 6 of this monstrosity of a book. I haven't edited anything yet. I'm going to save all my editing for this evening uh, just because, well, my, uh, it, I won't keep my husband awake while I'm chatting. I will uh, get as, and I'll be able to put something on that's quiet in the background and just record. Like, I don't know if you can actually hear the slight rumble of rain in the background, but I just put ASMR videos, either rain or fireplace. Excuse me. Just, just because. I don't know if Skitter is going to join us. She is in the middle of her nap time, and I don't want to disturb her calm. She's been a very good girl today. She only yelled a couple of times while I was on the phone. Ugh. So let's get going into the next chapter of the Sword of Shannara. Chapter 6 They spent the night camped within the protective fringes of the Black Oaks in a small clearing sheltered by the great trees and dense shrubbery which blotted out the dreariness of the lowlands of Cleet less than 50 yards to the west. The heavy mist dissipated within the forest and it was possible to look skyward to the magnificent canopy of interlocking boughs and leaves several hundred feet above them. Where there had been no sign of life in the deathly lowlands, within the giant oaks mingled sounds of insects and animal life whispered through the night. It was pleasant to hear living things again, and the three weary travelers felt at ease for the first time in days. But the lingering in the back of their minds was a memory of their prior journey to this deceptively peaceful haven. 
when they had been lost for several long days and nearly devoured by ravenous wolves that prowled deep within its confines. Moreover, the tales of an unfortunate travelers who attempted to pass through this same forest were too numerous to be disregarded. However, the young Sutherlanders felt reasonably secure at the edge of the Black Oaks and gratefully made preparations to start a fire. Wood was plentiful and dry. They stripped to the skin and hung their soggy garments on a line near the small blaze. A meal was quickly prepared the first hot one in five days, and devoured in minutes. The floor of the forest was soft and smooth, a comfortable bed compared to the dampened earth of the lowlands. As they lay quietly on their backs, gazing skyward at the gently swaying treetops, the bright light of the fire seemed to shoot upwards in faint streaks of orange that gave the impression of an altar burning in some great sanctuary. The light danced and glittered against the rough bark and the soft green moss that clang in dark patches to the massive trees. The forest insects maintained their steady hum in contentment. Occasionally, one would fly into the flames of the fire and extinguish its brief life with a dazzling flash. Once or twice, they heard the rustle of some small animal outside the light of the fire watching from the protective blackness. After a while, Menion rolled over on his side and looked curiously at Shay. What is the source of the power of those stones, Shay? Can they grant any wish? I'm still not sure. His voice trailed off and he shook his, shed, shook his head vaguely. Shay continued to lie motionless on his back, staring upwards for a few moments as he thought back on the events of that afternoon. He realized that none of them had spoken of the elf stone since the mysterious vision of the Black Oaks in that awesome display of incomprehensible power. He glanced over at Flick, who was watching him closely. I don't think I have that much control over them, he announced abruptly. It was almost as if they made the decision. He paused and then added absently, I don't think I can control them. Menion nodded thoughtfully and lay back again. Flick cleared his throat. What's the difference? They got us out of that dismal swamp, didn't they? Menion glanced sharply at Flick and shrugged. It might be helpful to know when we can count on that kind of support, don't you think? He breathed deeply and clasped his hands behind his head, his keen gaze shifting to the fire at his feet. Flick stirred uneasily across from him, glancing from Menion to his brother and back again. Shay said nothing his gaze focused on some imaginary point overhead. Long moments passed before the Highlanders spoke again. Well, 
At least we've made it this far, he declared cheerfully. Now for the next leg of the trip. He sat up and began to stretch a quick sketch, a quick map of the area in the dry earth. Shay and Flick sat up with him and watched quietly. Here we are, Menion pointed to a spot on the dirt map representing the fringe of the Black Oaks. At least that's where I think we are, he added quickly. To the north is the Mist Marsh, and further north of that is Rainbow Lake, out of which runs the Silver River east to the Anar Forest. Our best bet is to travel north tomorrow until we reach the edge of the Mist Marsh. Then we'll skirt the edge of the swamp. He traced a long line and come out on the other side of the Black Oaks. From there, we can travel due north until we run into the Silver River, and that should get us safely to the NR. Sorry about that abrupt pause. Miss Skittier here got uh, stuck to something and needed me to dislodge her. She was, uh, don't want her hurting her paws at this age. There's really not a whole lot a doctor can do for her. And then because she was completely blocking the light from my ring light and I couldn't read, I uh, adjusted it. It <laughs> in a very precarious position um, on the legs, on the uh, seat to my, on, on the rise to my recliner in between my legs. <laughs> But Skitter here is feeling a little better, so there we go. Sorry for the waste of a minute. All right. He paused and looked over at the other two. Neither seemed to be happy with the plan. What's the matter? He asked in bewilderment. This, the plan is designed to get us past the Black Oaks without forcing us to go directly through them, which was the cause for all the trouble the last time we were here. Don't forget those wolves are still in there somewhere. Shay nodded slowly and frowned. It's not the general plan, he began hastily. But we've heard tales of the Mist Marsh. Menion clapped his hand to his forehead in amazement. Oh no, not the old wives' tale about a mist wraith that lurks on the edges of the marsh waiting to devour stray travelers. Don't tell me you believe that. That's fine, coming from you, Flick blazed up angrily. I suppose you've forgotten who it was that told us how safe the Black Oaks were just before that last trip. All right, soothed the lean hunter. I'm not saying that this is a safe part of the country and that some very strange creatures don't inhabit these wo woods, but no one has ever seen this so-called creature of the marsh, and we have seen the wolves. Which do you choose? I suppose that your plan is the best one, interjected Shay hastily. But I would prefer it if we could cut as far east as possible 
while traveling through the forest to avoid as much of the mist marsh as possible. Agreed, exclaimed Menion, but it may prove to be a bit difficult when we haven't seen the sun in, th in three days and can't really be sure which way is east. Climb a tree, Flick suggested casually. Climb a, stuttered the other in unabashed amazement. Why, of course, why didn't I think of that? I'll just climb a 200, the 200 feet of slick, damp moss covered tree bark with my bare hands and feet. He shook his head in mock wonderment. Sometimes you appall me. He glanced wearily over at Shea for understanding, but the veilman had bounded excitedly to his brother's side. You brought the camping equipment? He demanded in astonishment. When the other nodded, he clapped him heartily on his broad back. Special boots and gloves and rope, he explained quite quickly to the bewildered Prince of Leah. Flick is the best climber in the Vale, and if anyone can make it up one of those monsters, he can. Menion shook his head uncomprehendingly. The boots and gloves are coated with a special substance just before use that makes the surface rough enough to grip even damp, mossy bark. He'll be able to climb one of these oaks tomorrow and check the position of the sun. Flick grinned smugly and nodded. Yes, indeed, wonder of wonders. Menion shook his head and looked over at the stocky veilman. Even the slow-witted are starting to think, my friends, we may make it yet. When they awoke the following morning, the forest was still dark with only faint traces of daylight filtering through the tops of the great oaks. A thin mist had drifted in off the lowlands, which when glimpsed from the edges of the forest, appeared as sunless and dismal as ever. It was cold in the woods, not, damp, not the damp, penetrating chill of the lowland country, but rather the brisk, crisp, cool of the forest's early morn. They ate a quick breakfast, and then Flick prepared to climb one of the towering oaks. He pulled on the heavy, flexible boots and gloves, which Shea then coated with a thick, pasty substance from a small container. Menion looked quizzically, but his curiosity changed to astonishment as the stocky veilman grasped the base of the great tree and with a, de a dexterity that belied both his bulky size and the difficulty of the task, proceeded to climb rapidly towards the summit. His strong limbs carried him upward through the tangle of heavy branches, and climbing became and the climbing became slower and more difficult. He was briefly lost from sight upon reaching the topmost branches, then reappeared, hast hasting down the smooth bar trunk to rejoin his friends. Quickly, the climbing gear was packed and the group proceeded in a northeasterly direction based on Flick's report of the, sun pre the sun's present position. Their chosen route should bring them out at a 
point along the east edge of the Mist Marsh. Menion believed the forest trek could be completed in one day. It was now early morning, and they were determined to be through the Black Oaks before darkness fell. So they marched steadily, at times rapidly, in single file. The keen eye Menion uh, led, picking out the best path, relaying heavily on his sense of direction in the semi-darkness. Shay followed close behind him, and Flick brought up the rear, glancing occasionally over his shoulder into the still forests. They stopped only three times to rest, and once more for a brief lunch, each time quickly resuming their march. They spoke infrequently, but the talk was light-hearted and cheerful. The day wore quickly away, and soon the first signs of nightfall were visible. Still, the forest stretched on before them with no indication of a break in the tr great trees. Worse than this, a heavy graying mistiness was once again seeping into view gradually thick in gradually thickening amounts. But this was a new kind of mist. It lacked the inconsistency of the lowland mist. This was an almost smoke-like substance that one could actually feel clinging to the body and clothes, gripping in its own particularly distasteful fashion. It felt seemingly like the clutching of hundreds of small, clammy, chilled hands seeking to pull the body down, and the three travelers felt an unmistakable revulsion at its insistent touch. Menion indicated that the heavy fog-like substance was from the mist marsh, and they were very close to the end of the forest. Eventually, the mist grew so heavy that it was impossible for the three to see more than a few feet. Menion slowed his pace to a crawl because of the increasingly poor visibility, and they remained close to each other to avoid separation. By this time, the day was so far gone that even without the mist, the forest would have appeared almost black. But with the added dimness called by the swirling wall of heavy moisture, it was nearly impossible to pick out any sort of path. It was almost as if the three were suspended in a limbo world where the only solidity of the invisible ground on which they trod offered any evidence of reality. It finally became so difficult to see that Menion instructed the other two to bind themselves together and to him by a length of rope to prevent separation. This was done this was quickly done, and the slow march resumed. Menion knew that they had to be very near the mist marsh and carefully peered into the grayness ahead in an effort to catch a glimpse of a breakthrough. Even so, when at last he did reach the ed of, edge of the marshland, bordering the northern fringes of the Black Oaks. He did not realize what had happened 
until he had already stepped knee deep into the thick gray waters. The chill, death-like clutching of the mud beneath, coupled with his surprise, caused him to slip further down, and only his quick warning saved Shay and Flick from a similar fate. Responding to his cry, they hauled on the rope that bound them together and hastily pulled their comrade from the bog and certain death. The sullen, slime-covered waters of the great swamp covered only thinly by the bottomless mud beneath, which lacked the rapid suction of quicksand, but accomplished the same result in a slightly longer time span. Anything or anyone caught in its grip was doomed to a slow death by suffocation in an immeasurable abyss. For utter uh, for untold ages its silent surface had fooled unwary creatures in attempting to cross or skirt or perhaps only to test its mirrorless waters and the decayed remains of all lay buried together somewhere beneath its placid face the three travelers stood silently on the banks, looking at it and experiencing inwardly the horror of its dark secret. Even many and Leah shuddered as he remembered its brief, clutching inv invitation to him to share the fate of so many others. For one spellbound second, the dead paraded as shadows before them and were gone. What happened? exclaimed Shay suddenly, his voice breaking the silence with deafening sharpness. We should have avoided this swamp. Menion looked upward and about for a few seconds, then shook his head. We've come too far to the west. We'll have to follow the edge of the bog around to the east until we can be break free from this mist and the black oaks. He paused and considered the time of day. I'm not spending the night in this place, Flick declared vehemently, anticipating the other's query. I'd rather walk all night and most of tomorrow and probably the next day. Their quick decision was to continue along the edge of the mist marsh until they reached open land to the east and then stop for the night. Shay was still concerned about being caught in open country by the skull bearers, but his growing dread of the swamp overshadowed even this fear. And his foremost thought was getting was to get as far away as possible. The trio tightened the ropes about their waists and in single file began to move along the uneven shoreline of the marsh. Their eyes glued to the faint path ahead. Menion guided them cautiously, avoiding the tangle of treacherous roots and weeds that grew in abundance along the swamp's edge. Their twisted, knotted forms seemingly alive in the eerie half-light of the rolling gray mist. At times, the ground became soft mud, dangerously like that of the marsh itself, 
and had to be skirted. At other times, huge trees blocked the path, their great trunks leaning heavily towards the dull, lifeless surface of the swamp's waters. Their branches drooping sadly, motionless as they waited their, for their death that lay only inches below. If the lowlands of Cleet had been a dying land, then this marsh was the death that waited, an infinite, ageless death that gave no sign, no warning, no movement as it crouched concealed within the very land it had so in, in, uh, brutally destroyed. The chilling dampness of the lowlands was here, but coupled with it was the unexplainable feeling of the heavy, stagnant slime. The swamp waters permeated the mist as well, clutching eagerly at the wary travelers. The mist about them swirled slowly, but there was no sign of wind, no sound of a breeze rustling. The tall swamp grass or dying of or dying oaks all was still a silence of permanent death that knew well who was the master they had walked for perhaps an hour when shay first sensed that something was wrong there was no reason for the feeling it stole over him gradually until every sense was keyed, trying to find where the trouble lay. Walking silently between the other two, he listened intently, peering first into the great oaks, then out over the swamp. Finally, he concluded with a chilling certainty that they were not alone, that something else was out there in the invisible beyond them. For one brief moment, the young Valman was so terrified by the thought that he was unable to speak or even to gesture. He could only walk ahead, his mind frozen, waiting for the unspeakable to happen. But then, with a supreme effort, he calmed his scattered thoughts and brought the other two men to an abrupt halt. Menion looked about around quizzically and started to speak. But Shay silenced him with a finger to his own lips and a gesture towards the swamp. Flick was already looking cautiously in that direction, his own sixth sense having warned him of his brother's fear. For long moments, they stood motionless at the edge of the marsh their eyes and ears concentrated on the impenetrable mist moving sluggishly above the surface of the dead water. The silence was oppressive. And I think you were mistaken, Menion whispered finally as re he relaxed his vigil. Sometimes when you are this tired, it's easy to imagine things. Shay shook his head negatively and looked at Flick. I don't know, the other conceded. I thought I sent something. A mist wraith, chided Menion, grinning. Maybe you're right, 
Shay interceded quickly. I am pretty tired and, and could imagine anything at this point. Let's keep moving and get out of this place. They hastily resumed the dreary trek, but for the next few minutes remained alert for anything unusual. When nothing happened, they began to let their thoughts drift to other matters. Shay had just succeeded in convincing himself that he had been mistaken and the victim of an overactive imagination brought about by lack of sleep when Flick cried out. Immediately, Shay felt the rope that bound them together jerk sharply and begin to drag him in the direction of the deadly swamp. He lost his balance and fell unable to distinguish anything in the mist. For one fleeting moment, he thought he glimpsed his brother's body suspended several feet in the air over the swamp, the rope still tied to his waist. In the next second, Shay felt the chill of the swamp grapple at his legs. They might have all been lost had it not been for the quick reflexes of the Prince of Leah. At the first sharp jerk of the rope, he had instinctively grasped at the only thing near enough to keep him on his feet. It was a huge sinking oak. Its trunk it embedded so far into the soft ground that its upper branches were within reach. And many on rapidly hooked one arm about the nearest bough and with the other grasped the rope about his waist and tried to uh, pull back. Shay, now up to his knees in the swamp mud, felt the rope go taut on Menion's end and tried to brace himself to aid. Flick was crying out sharply in the darkness above the swamp, and both Menion and Shay shouted encouragement. Suddenly, the rope between Flick and Shay went slack, and out of the gray mistiness emerged the stout, struggling form of, Shay Oms of Flick Omsford still suspended above the water's surface, his waist gripped by what appeared to be a sort of greenish, weed-covered tentacle. His right hand held the long silver dagger, which gleamed menacingly as it slashed in repeated cuts at the thing which held him. Shay yanked hard on the rope which bound them, trying to aid his brother in breaking free. And a moment later, he succeeded as the tentacle whipped back into the mist, releasing the still struggling Flick, who promptly fell into the marsh below. Shay had barely pulled his exhausted brother from the clutches of the swamp, freed him from the rope, and helped him to his feet before several more of the greenish arms shot out of the misty darkness. And knock, uh, they knocked the shaken flick sprawling, and one closed about the left arm of an astonished Shay before he could think to dodge. He felt himself drawn towards the swamp and drew his own dagger to strike fiercely at the slime-covered tentacle. As he fought, 
he caught sight of something huge out in the marsh, its bulk covered by the night and the swamp. To one side, Flick again became entangled in the grip of two more tentacles, and his stocky form was dragged relentlessly towards the water's edge. Violently, Shay broke free from the tentacle that held his arm, slashing through the repulsive limb with one great cut, struggling to reach his brother. He felt another tentacle grasp his leg, knocking his feet out from under him. As he fell, his, his head struck an oak root, and he lost consciousness. Again, they were saved by Menion, his lithe form leaping out of the darkness behind, the great sword flashing dully in a wide arc as it severed in one powerful swing the tentacle that held the unconscious Shay. A second later, the Highlander was at Flick's side, cutting and chopping his way past the arms, which suddenly reached for him out of the darkness, and with a series of quick, well-placed blows, freed the other Veilmen. For a moment, the tentacles disappeared back into the mist of the swamp, and Flick and Menion hastened to pull the unconscious Shay back from the unprotected edge of the water. But before any of them could reach the safety of the great oaks, the greenish arms again shot out of the darkness. Without hesitation, Menion and Flay placed themselves in front of their motionless friend and struck out at the encircling arms. The fight was silent, save for the labored breathing of the men as they struck again and again, chopping off bits and pieces, and sometimes whole ends of the grasping tentacles. But any damage they caused did not seem to affect the monster in the swamp, which attacked with renewed fury at each stroke. Menion cursed himself for not remembering to drag the great ash bow within reach so that he could have, he could have taken a shot at whatever it was that lay beyond the mist. Shay! He yelled desperately, Shay, wake up, or for the love of heaven, we're done for. The silent form behind him stirred slightly. Get up, Shay, pleaded Flick hoarsely, his own arms exhausted from the great strain of fighting off the tentacles. The stones, yelled many on. Get the elf stones. Shay struggled to a kneeling position, but he was knocked flat again by the force of the battle in front of him. He heard Menion shouting and dazedly felt for his pack, realizing almost immediately that he had dropped it while helping Flick. He saw it now several yards to the right, the tentacles waving menacingly over it. Menion seemed to realize this at the same moment and charged forward with a wild cry, his long sword cutting a path for the others. Flick was at his side, the small dagger still in his hand. With a final surge of his fading strength, Shay leaped to his feet and launched himself towards the pack containing the precious elf stones. His slim form 
slipped between several of the grasping arms and he threw himself on the pack. His hand was inside, groping for the pouch. When the first tentacle reached his unprotected legs, kicking and struggling, he fought to keep his freedom for the few seconds he needed to find the stones. For a moment, he thought he had lost them again. Then his hand closed over the small pouch, and he yanked it from his fallen pack. A sudden blow from the writhing tentacles almost caused him to drop it, and he clutched it tightly to his chest as he loosened the drawstrings with numbing slowness. Flick had been forced back so far that he stumbled against Shay's outstretched body and fell over backwards, the tentacles coming down on top of them both. Now only the lean form of Menion stood between them and the giant attacker, both hands gripping tightly the sword of Leia. Almost without realizing it, Shay found the three blue, blue stones in his hand, free from the pouch at last. Scrambling backwards, struggling to his feet, the young Velman let out a wild cry of triumph and held forth the faintly glowing elf stones. The power locked, uh, locked from within flared up immediately, flooding the darkness with dazzling blue light. Flick and Menion leaped back, shielding their eyes from the glare. The tentacles drew back hesitantly, uncertainly, and as the three men risked a second quick glance, they saw the brilliant light of the elf stones streak outward into the mist above the swamp, cutting through its vapor with the keenness of a knife. They saw it strike with a shattering impact the huge, unspeakable bulk that had attacked them as it was sinking sluggishly beneath the slime covered waters. At the same instant, the glare above the disappearing monster reached the internally, uh, the intensity of a small sun, and the water steamed with blue flames that seared upward into the shrouded sky. One moment, the burning glare and the flames were there, and the next, they were gone. The mist and the night returned, and the three companions were alone again in the blackness of the marshland. They quickly sheathed their weapons, picked up the fallen packs, and dropped back among the huge black oaks. The swamp remained as silent as it had been before the unexpected attack, its dull waters disturbingly placid beneath the gray haze. For several moments, no one spoke as they collapsed silently against the trunks of the great trees and breathed deeply, grateful to be alive. The whole battle had happened quickly, like the passing of a brief, horrible instant in an all-too-real nightmare. Flick was completely drenched by the swamp waters, and Shay was soaked from the waist down. Both shivered in the chill night air. After only a few seconds of rest, they began moving slowly about 
in an effort to ward off the numbing cold. Realizing that they had to get free of the marshland quickly, Menion swung his tired body away from the resting place against the rough bark covered oak trunk and in one uh, and in one smooth motion swung his pack in play, into place over his shoulders. Shay and Flick were quick to follow, though somewhat less eager. They conferred briefly to decide what direction it would best be take best to take now. The choice was simple. Proceed through the black oaks and risk becoming lost and being set again by the wandering wolf packs, or follow the edge of the swamp and chance a second encounter with the mist wraith. Neither choice held much appeal, but the battle with the creature from the mist marsh was too recent to permit any of them to risk a repeat performance. So the decision was made to stick to the woods, to try to follow a course parallel to the shoreline of the swamp and hopefully gain the open country within the next few hours. They now had reached the point where the long hours of traveling with the keen anticipation of danger had chipped and worn away the clear reasoning of the morning. They were tired and frightened by the strange world into which they had journeyed, and the one clear thought left in their numbed minds was to break through this stifling forest that they might find a few hours of welcome sleep. With that dominating their thoughts and riding with the caution that was so desperately needed, they forgot to tie themselves together again. The journey continued as before, with many on in the lead, Shay a few place, paces back, and Flick trailing, all walking silently and steadily, their minds fixed on the reassuring thought that ahead lay the sunlit, open grasslands that would take them to the NR. The mist seemed to have dissipated slightly, and while Menion's form was only a shadow, Shay could make him out well enough to follow. Yet at times, both Shay and Flick would lose sight of the person immediately in the front and would find their eyes straining wearily to keep the path Menion was making for them. The minutes passed with an agonizing slowness, and the sharpness of each man's eyesight began to lessen with their increasing need for sleep. Minutes lengthened into long, endless hours, and they still plodded slowly onward through the misty haze of the great black oaks. They found it impossible to tell how far they had traveled or how much time had passed. Soon it failed to matter at all. They became sleepwalkers in a world of half-dreams and rambling thoughts with no break in the wearying march, wearying march, or the never-ending silent black trunks that came and passed in countless thousands. The only change was a gradual building of the wind from somewhere in the shrouding night, whispering its faint, first faint cry, then growing to a numbing crescendo that, uh, of sound that gripped the tired minds of the three travelers with spellbinding magic. 
it called to them, reminding them of the briefness of the days behind and those ahead, warning them that they were mortal creatures of no consequence in the land, crying to them to lay down in the peacefulness of sleep. They heard and fought against the tempting plea with the last of their strength, concentrating mindlessly on putting one foot before the other in an endless succession of footsteps. One minute they were all there in a ragged line. The next, Shay looked ahead and Menion was gone. At first, he could not accept the fact his normally keen mind hazed, hazy with lack of sleep, and he continued to walk slowly ahead, looking vainly for the shadowy form of the, high, of the tall Highlander. Then, abruptly, he stopped as he realized with a stabbing fear that they had somehow become separated. He clutched wildly for Flick and grabbed his brother's loose tunic as the fatigued Valman stumbled into him, dead on his feet. Flick looked unthinkingly at him, not knowing, not even caring why they had stopped. His own, his only hope that he could collapse at last and sleep. The wind in the darkness of the forest seemed to howl in wild glee, and Shay called desperately for the Highland Prince and heard only the echoes of his own futile cry. He called again and again his voice rising to a near scream of desperation and fear, but nothing came back except the sound of his own voice, muffled and distorted by the wild whistling of the wind through the great oaks, whistling and rapping about the silent trunks and limbs, and, and filtering out among the rustling leaves. Once he thought he heard his own name called, answering eagerly. He dragged himself and the exhausted flick through the maze of trees towards the sound of the cry. But there was nothing. Dropping to the forest floor, he called until his voice gave out but only the wind replied in mocking laughter to tell him that he lost the Prince of Leah. And that, my dear friends, is the end of chapter six. So I think that was just about as long as the previous chapter was. I know it's going to be a little over an hour. Um, and holy, oh my goodness, run on effing sentences. There were sentences that were like five, six lines long. And I was trying to find a good place to take a breath, but there wasn't any good place. And then the words would start to peter out. And I was like, oh, let's get that next word out. I am sorry if there's any gasps or sounds really weird. Sorry, uh, I'm in a little bit of a different position now. I am holding the phone with my hands. I don't have the microphone plugged in. Just as I finished the chapter, we had a fire alarm in the building and I had to rush to get my cats into their carrier, get my surgical boot on, get my walker, and get the heck out of here only to find out it was a false alarm. Well, thank God it was a false alarm, but still, 
is a little frustrating. Whew. So I just got back up. I My package from Amazon should be delivered very shortly. So I may actually, if I can get it working, I may actually stream a little this, ev uh, this evening. Um, and I'm very much, very, very much looking forward to doing that. Oh, sorry for the craziness. You guys are all wonderful. We'll uh, see you again soon. Ah, hope you have a great morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it is there. And please like, comment, and subscribe if you want. If not, I'm just very thankful that you came today. Have a great one. Bye-bye.